Chapman. Um, I'm going to just talk for just a minute about, about why I'm here and what's going on. Um, for the last five years, I've been pretty involved in uh, working with a ever-growing group trying to reform the National Organic Program, which has wandered pretty far from its mission of uh, protecting the integrity and, and transparency uh, of organic as uh, run by the USDA. And um, I was brought into the issue, uh, oh, <laughs> okay, yeah, <laughs> all right, well that, that is what it's about. I fought the law and the law won. How did that happen? Uh, there were three big issues that, that we've ended up dealing with in the National Organic Program in which I believe that the, the program is, is, the program, National Organic Program, we'll call it the NOP, just for shortness, that's its initials. And that's here, and the organic movement, I think, is something quite different. And for a number of years, they traveled together, but they seem to be separating now, more and more, and rather rapidly all the time. And there are three issues that uh, have become a pretty big uh, source of conflict. And one is the issue of soilless growing, being certified as organic, hydroponic. And uh, that's what drew me in. I became aware of it. And as I came in, I realized that another gigantic issue was uh, CAFO uh, livestock production that's concentrated animal feeding operations, CAFO. So, uh, that's become a, a gigantic issue. And the third one is fraudulent imports of grain. And all of these have been laid out pretty well by the Washington Post in a series of articles. Um, right now, I would say, leaving aside the question of fraudulent grain, CAFOs and hydros are accounting for about, at my best guess, about $2 billion a year in sales as certified organic. So uh, it's a real thing, and it's a, a gigantic thing. Um, and the result of this coming into the organic program is that real organic farmers are disappearing from um, the stores more and more. And we see many organic dairy farmers now are, in fact, going out of business because the, they can't compete with an 18,000 cow CAFO um, in terms of cost of production. And, um, but in the marketplace, that's exactly what they have to do. And when you get that CAFO milk, it's got a nice picture of a cow in the pasture on the cover. <laughs> and the same is true for the chickens. And uh, these animals have never seen pasture in their lives, right? And, but people are buying it thinking that's what they're getting. So uh, it's a real thing, and uh, the CAFOs and the hydros have a great deal of money, um, two billion dollars, <laughs> and they're, they, as a result, they, they are using that money for lobbyists, and, uh, and they're getting their way. They're, they're, they're getting their way. They right now have a very intimate relationship with the Senate Agriculture Committee. I have a very intimate relationship with Greg Eibach, who is the Deputy Secretary of Agriculture. And there's a lot of pressure coming from those, those forces down to the little National Organic Program to allow these practices to continue. And they're winning, and we're losing. So uh, what we have done in uh, the last couple of months after a sort of final meltdown in Florida with the National Organic Program last fall is uh, started something called the Real Organic Project. And you can, you can find out a bit more about it by going to the website realorganicproject.org. We formed a group of 15 people who are meeting in about a week from all over the country nine farmers and six people from um, nonprofits and scientists and whatnot um, to set standards for this. It's going to be an add-on label. We're going to create a label that eventually, hopefully, people will recognize. Um, 
And we're also promoting a campaign called Just Ask, and in which we're encouraging all of you, all of us, to go to the store that we shop at and just ask, um, were these eggs grown in a CAFO? Were these tomatoes grown hydroponically? And they won't know the answer to that, but if all of you ask them, they will find out. They will start to actually be concerned, and if we had 50 people go to every store in America and ask, we would win overnight, and we would have the organic program back again. So maybe that's enough. So this is Roger Noonan. And that, that's Dave Chapman. Dave Chapman grows tomatoes at uh, Long Wind Farm. Uh, aptly named, too, buddy. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm an organic farmer, certified, USDA certified. I farm my family. My daughter Heather's right there. Give a shout out, Heather. And uh, we're in New Boston. Um, certified by the state of New Hampshire Department of Ag. I don't think anyone's here from the agency of Ag today. Uh, I'm involved with the New England Farmers Union and just about every other organization or have been and you know doing advocacy work for, for small-scale family farming. Um, I got involved with this issue after talking with Dave on uh, NOFA summer conference a few years ago um, down in uh, Amherst uh, and it, it was a big issue. He, he laid out uh, in very in-depth detail, just sort of the, the situation. Uh, we had several uh, tries at uh, the NOSB using the National Organic Standards Board to sort of work around that problem. We tried politically to work around that problem, but it is hard when you're a bunch of small holders in the tidal wave of resources that these big companies have. Um, and the Jacksonville, after I left the Jacksonville NOSB meeting, I had half a mind to tear up my certificate. But um, I, I'm proud of my certificate, and I'm proud of my farm, and I'm proud of the way we farm and the practices we use. And uh, so I didn't, but I, I thought about it. Um, I'm going to turn it over to, to Michael here, and uh, there he goes. I'm a guy who sat in this seat, and apparently I'm on this panel. <laughs> No, I am Michael Phillips. I live up in northern New Hampshire. I grow holistic fruit, healthy fruit. And a long time ago, I was certified by the, the New Hampshire version before the USDA got involved. And I'm, I'm one of those who said, giving the word organic to the USDA is just not going to work. And I totally admire the work of everyone trying to find an end around around that. Um, I, I s still feel that way. I have done a lot of carpentry work in my time, built a poster being barn, and if the foundation isn't strong, no matter what you put on top of it, it's, it ends up collapsing. And then as a writer, you know, I write books. I have several books with Chelsea Green. So words fascinate me. And I like the word organic, and it should mean what it, we think it means. It does mean what we think it means. But yet, it's, it's altered now, and, it, and it's actually not, you're not allowed to use the word organic unless you go through the system. You rent the word back from the USDA. I'm, again, I'm, I'm the live free or die guy up here, so I, I accept. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, actually, we're much all more on the same page and not. But for me, a long time ago, I have a slide in my presentations where I, I say, you know, what word do you call yourself? Are you organic? Are you biodynamic? Are you low spray? Are you ecological? Are you, are you integrated fruit production? It's interesting, there, there's now in fruit orcharding a term conventional organic, which means using a lot of mineral fungicides. It's, it's, again, it's all the words. And for me, the recognition that there's a way of growing that works with the health of the system and builds on, on the system, which is what true organic is. And there are remedies to deal with symptoms, pests and disease, that we treat allopathically, basically through toxins. And there are organic toxins and there are conventional chemical toxins. And 
neither necessarily supports the health of the system in the, in the organic standards. That's addressed. You know, you don't want to go to this extent if you don't have to. Um, but that just really was a clarion call. This is about growing healthy food. You know, in one sense, as a writer, that's the term I'd like to say. We grow healthy food. That's our sign. I mean, organic is fine as a word in there, too. And, and why do we have to meet certain standards to grow healthy food as opposed to less healthy food having to prove it's even worth selling? So maybe we go to your slides. And... Last, last fall, well, in 2015, I think we had our first rally, very impromptu thing up in Stowe, Vermont, and about 50 farmers showed up at an NOSB meeting. We only thought of it two days before, and we called around, and a bunch of people came, and five tractors came, and we marched around the block, and it was really good fun. Ellie Coleman very kindly came over from Maine and, and gave us a little gravitas, and, uh, and actually that little rally really changed the conversation nationally, as amazing as that is because uh, everybody in the meeting was both delighted and a little horrified that all these organic pioneer types were out there objecting to the National Organic Program's behavior. And the next year we had a bigger rally in Vermont, and this time we got Senator Leahy, and we got uh, Representative Peter Welsh and Representative Shelley Pingree, and we got about 250 people, farmers and eaters, and it was very powerful. Also a lot of fun. That seems to be the trademark of the rallies. Um, and then this last fall, we had 15 rallies. Um, one was down in uh, Costa Rica, I think, and uh, one was in Quebec. And the rest went from California, there were two there, all the way to Maine and all the way down to Florida was the final one. And uh, over 50 people spoke at those rallies. Um, in including Daphne Miller at the Colorado rally, um, and including everybody up here on stage with me, uh, spoke at the New Hampshire rally in Hanover. So, um, I, you know, it's interesting what Michael's saying, because he's right, we all agree with him, and, and uh, part of me just wants to walk away from it and say, look, we farm the way we farm, and we're proud of it. And another part of me doesn't, want to do that and, you know, spent a long time, most of my adult life, sort of trying to, oh, I forgot to take off my shirt, I will in a minute, uh, I have a good t-shirt on, to protect organic, okay. Alright, there we go. So, to protect organic, and these t-shirts came out of the, uh, out of the rallies. Um, yes, Absolutely. let's have a question. Yes. Right. Are we just going to confuse the marketplace? Right. And what I say is if you aren't confused, you aren't paying attention. <laughs> right? Because really, I'm serious. It's confusing. The reality is confusing. So the only way we can avoid confusion is by avoiding reality. And the only way that the National Organic Program is going to thrive for all of you is by misleading you. Because the reality of what that is in the stores, more and more, is going to be CAFOs and hydros. Already, organic eggs in America, over three quarters of them are coming from CAFOs. I got that figure from Miles McAvoy, the director of the National Organic Program. Right? The egg lobby says it's more like 90%. So it's a lot. Right? It's, it's $800 million of eggs that none of us, I would guess, would call organic. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, and I think it does, it has that potential. For farmers like Michael and I, I don't need to be certified organic for my markets. Uh, I, do, I do for my co-op, but, uh, but even uh, we collectively could surrender our certificates 
our customers know us, we're transparent. Uh, for me as a farmer, it just gives me sort of the, it gives me the lane to stay in. And I, I find it useful uh, as a farmer to sort of have that structure. Otherwise, I'd have no structure and, you know, I'd be all over the place. So I like having a lane to stay in. Um, you know, I, but we have access, ready access to a lot of local markets. Farmers that are out in rural areas don't. So they're the ones who I think would really suffer from this label fatigue. You know, where's the dairy farmer? How is the organic dairy farmer that's wholesaling, sending the tr milk uh, on that truck for Organic Valley? How are they going to get grocery shelf space? How are they going to start competing for that? Uh, you know, the more you fragment the market, the, you know, the more you have winners and losers. That's as, the economic impact of our agricultural policy and system is, is what is crushed the soul of American agriculture. It's why we have mega farms. Uh, so it's not, it makes perfect sense that it would only happen in organic as well, because if there's a dollar to be made. Um, and I know this gentleman up here, Amy, too, wanted, would pat his hand up for a question as well. So I'm going to see if Michael can uh, I recognize the need for some structure and integrity in the language. I just want organic to be our word again. And I don't, I don't want an adjective in front of it, although I, I love the whole extra label with the real organic project. Um, but we need a lot of changes in government, don't we? <laughs> it's a hard answer. We've been struggling with it for decades. Um, again, and I agree, my markets are local. People know me. People know my apples. I want to sell my apples by flavor. I think one of probably the most potentially telling ways that we might achieve something more is the Bionutrient Association with this idea of a meter to, to measure nutrient density. How was something grown? And was it grown in such a way that it made the food richer, more full, more nutrient dense? And, and if that actually takes the form of a phone app, and it doesn't matter what label is stuck on that apple or avocado, and it tells you this is good and this is not so good, um, that's going to change things. But yeah, next question. Just, just one thing to what Michael just said. In the meantime, until that app comes out, we have an app, and it's called Our Tongue. And, and we can tell the difference between quality food and low-quality food by the, by the taste. The problem is, and this is what's happening, is that even if it tastes good, even if people want it, it is getting pushed off the shelves. It's pretty hard to go into a supermarket in America right now and get a soil-grown tomato. You can here. You know, you can in Vermont, you can in Massachusetts, but most of the country, you cannot. You go in, and they're all hydroponic now, and that has changed, and I have actually done a lot of research. All the soil growers have changed crops because that market is dead to them. So we, even if it, we can tell with our sensor, it's not going to be a choice. This is a pretty big economic political issue. I'm sorry, yeah. Have you looked into the the biophagenic movement at all? And would it make sense to simply, rather than fight, just abandon the word organic and fight with your clients who are buying your products and just say, look, organic is junk. We'll walk away from organic. This is what we're doing. It's about soil. It's about soil health. It's about animals walking on grass and pasture rotation and just walk away from the word because it's been stolen so the question was if we thought about walking away from the word organic and maybe going to uh, biodynamic or something like that because uh, organic is perhaps lost its meaning, the word. Uh, for me, personally, I look at the phenomenal success that we have had building the organic movement over the last 30 years and, uh, you know, People in America, many people are turning to the organic label in an effort to buy healthy food. And uh, that is a wonderful thing. And they're willing to pay a premium for it. But, uh, you know, so we can start all over from scratch. I think you might have a smaller job on your hand to, to just change the word that's in the forefront of people's brains than to give your word back. Yeah. I agree. Thank you.
but it took 20 years to get organic on the grocery store shelf. So it's a long, you know, it's a long process. And, and, and like I said, I want to, I think it's important to, to, to point out the difference between those of us that are in sort of the local market and those of us that are in rural areas or, you know, or the dairy farmer, there's only so much raw milk or home-based pasteurizing and home-based cheese making you can do and fight for that shelf space. Fighting for shelf space at the grocery stores is, is a business unto itself. Um, and, you know, now we've had Whole Foods get absorbed by Amazon. There's, you know, so those of us that, that saw that as sort of a, an easy, accessible wholesale market, if you wanted to scale up, that's getting to be more of a challenge. There's a lot more price pressure coming from Whole Foods now. Um, so again, those farmers that are out in the rural areas that are maybe going to start growing the organic grains, uh, because, you know, we've had this fraud and there's a serious need for organic grains for the, for the increasingly capo poultry operations. But, um, you know, those are all, those of us that, you know, believe in the value of the soil health benefits associated with organic clearly see that that's, that's probably a better outcome for our, for our rivers in the Midwest if there are more organic acres out there. So, you know, I, I'm, you know, you can have a label for anything you want, and, and th that's what, you know, market segmentation is how American business is driven. Um, but I just always look out for the unintended consequences of um, these, <coughs> these actions. So. so let's remember that I live close to Quebec. Let's remember, if you could, Roger, um, could you just read what the, the red words are on that label? Organic apple cider vinegar. Could you read that of course? Uh, biologique. Is that right? My French in, in Quebec, the word for organic is biologique. I now have biologique cider vinegar. Voila. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you know, that, that's a good point because any label that has any veracity has an audit requirement and record keeping requirements and then costs that, you know, the farmer has. And, to, to bear, you know, and we're gonna looks like we're gonna lose the organic cost share. So, the, how many folks in here are certified organic? There's quite a few of us, right? So, you know, that little bit we get back for doing that record keeping. That's a great thing, and it'll cap out. And I'm not sure if we do manage to hang on to the organic cost share, which you know we're fighting for. But um, will that apply to the requirements for some of these other labels? So those are you know those are the things I'm I'm going to think about. I'm a little bit more on the practical side. Like how am I going to deal with this? How are we going to deal with it as farmers? What is the paperwork trail like? The market is always the force. Uh, especially as you get deeper into that value chain. Once you get beyond your local community, there are market forces that are above my pay scale that I can't, you know, I cannot compete with the marketing heft of some of the companies that are, that put us on this stage today to discuss what happened to organic. So I, I know this young lady said the question. I would have taken the, uh, the opposite approach of abandonment of the word organic because um, as a processor who this year close to 100,000 pounds of certified organic produce, I'm thinking more so along the lines of working in liaison um, with organizations. Um, I know that Rodale just put up their regenerative uh, the profiles. There's still not a ton of information online, but also the real organic. It seems to me that there would be strength in numbers that are uh, working in liaison to create uh, a more um, coalescence in the strength in numbers than to uh, to work the good work against the opposition of keeping integrity programs intact. Um, just briefly, I can respond. She she was talking about the Rodale's regenerative organic certification, which I support. Um, but I don't qualify for, and almost nobody I've met qualifies for it. It's well, it's it's big, and uh, you got to definitely want to, and you you know it it really is. I think what we might all aspire towards. So I support that that it it, it is really demanding, uh, dramatic, re reduced tillage, hard for vegetable farmers mostly. I, I, that happens to be something I can do, but. But for most people, probably Roger would not qualify for that. Um, very uh, 
uh, strict worker welfare standards, which I support, but most people I know cannot meet that. So it's a, it's a very high level, and we're kind of a working class organic in the sense that we're really just talking about the organic everyone thinks they're buying. And uh, we're just throwing out the CAFOs and the hydros. Our standards are going to be very simple. Um, but we're not in opposition to them, and we talk to them. Jeff Moyer, who's the head of Rodale, is on our board of advisors. We have an amazing board of advisors, um, and uh, we're all on the same side. Yeah, this is the first time that I've heard about Real Organic, and I want to know more because I think that there is a common ground that more needs to get out because there are different tiers who started wherever you are there's a level of development if you're already certified organic. Right. Your level of activism. Right. We consider the National Organic Program to be the transitional program. And uh, you know, we will be a, a higher floor and and Rodales will be higher higher yet. Um and, yeah, uh, our goal absolutely though is not to have the farmers have to pay too much to play, and you know, Real Organic Project only started in January, so we've been moving very very fast. Uh, we really have, but uh, this is a, a very young effort, um, and we get an incredible amount of national press in in, in three months. Uh, you know, I feel like I'm getting interviewed every second day. But um, anyway. Yeah, so we're all working together. I, I, I don't think there's opposition here. And the same is true with the biodynamic movement. So uh, you, you had your hand up for quite a while. All right, well, just to say, if you were to go with a different name, it won't be a matter of time before they would take over that name. <laughs> right. So he's saying no matter what name we, we come up with, uh, it will be taken over, and I, I actually agree with that. Uh, at some point, it will take them a little longer if we're not a government agency. But uh, I imagine if the Real Organic Project actually succeeds, and we come up with a label, which we don't even know what it'll be called yet, that in uh, 15 or 20 years we will need to start a new organization. And I don't know a way around that. Uh, if we succeed, we become uh, economically attractive and uh, it is the nature of capitalism that uh, companies will respond to that and try to figure out how to take advantage of it. Um, so yeah, yeah, go ahead and then we'll get you. Yeah. I was just curious, at what level do you think uh, this needs to kind of be thrown back on the consumer? Because you can spend a lot of time reinventing labels and doing things, but if consumers have no knowledge, which people in this room have knowledge. And consumers don't know what they're buying, they don't know where it's coming from, and they don't know that it's junk, and they think it's supposed to cost two bucks. But for you to make a living, it needs to cost four. You need that's the real price of food. So that's a great question. And just for those folks that didn't hear in the back, at what point is this on the consumer to, to sort of sort out and find the truth? And I'd say it, at every point. And, and that's the power of, you know, that's that mass marketing power, you know, Madison Avenue of, of these, you know, they just have the power to put the message out there they want. Um, I just saw, you know, I, I get a lot of uh, the packer, which is this, you know, a food, you know, food industry thing. And they just had this new company that had this label that was like a label my daughter uh, or Sarah might have drawn up for local harvest CSA. And, and it's a complete sham. I mean, it looks like it's a hand-drawn thing. It's a big hydro operation out of Florida. Uh, they're certified organic and, and proudly taunting it. And, you know, it's it's like, pepper, I used to always use the example of Pepperidge Farms. Where the hell is Pepperidge Farms? There's no Pepperidge Farms. But, you know, it, it's a nice, you know, and Dave, you make this point. They always want to hold up the farms up here on the stage as sort of the standard for of care of the land and the product. But this, it's not the case. You, know, you don't see, uh, you know, the picture of the of the cave. You don't see the picture of the desert that's being irrigated with tertiary treated sewage. I mean, that, you know, that, that that organic lettuce. I don't necessarily know about the organic lettuce, uh, but I know a lot of the a lot of those salad greens coming out of California and especially particularly in Arizona, they're using tertiary, which means it's safe to drink, wastewater. 
uh, out of this because they have no water there. That is not something they're saying. You know, hey, we're so sustainable, we're recycling your poop and urine uh, to, to grow these crops. If they were truly sustainable, then they, maybe they would try to find a way to market that, but they can't. So instead, they put a little, little greenhouse on the cover, uh, a couple of happy kids out there picking the tomatoes or whatever, and it's a complete sham. We, we do not have the capacity to fight back against that other than by education. And who is going to pick that up? You know, uh, you do it at the local level, and it's hard, to, it's hard to get that into the mainstream. And then when you do talk to some of these national press people, We've got a, you know, we, we have a, always have a challenge there because some of the arguments we had in Jacksonville about basically being a bunch of whining middle class white men, that we were not allowing diversity because access to land was too prohibitive. And so therefore these you know, folks in the urban areas needed to do hydroponics, which was a complete, I mean, it was, a, it was the most absurd argument I ever heard. But they used it effectively in the press against us. Let's just do one more question, yep. and then we'll wrap up with the video and move into our next workshop. I, I just want to say before that one question, you know, I, I don't want to abandon organic. I want to fight for it. On the other hand, you know, so what's the opportunity here? You bring up the consumer, and like, how do we keep it clear for the consumer that if farmers solve it, will the consumer follow? Let's bring this confusion to the consumer. Let them know that health matters and, and real food is how you stay away from the doctor and how you live a longer life and a healthier life. And it's in that mass confusion that more people are going to get it. They're not going to get it through the label battle. Thanks. Uh, the the non-GMO project has been very successful in getting individual companies and products uh, certified and getting that label on packages in the grocery store. My wife and I, we always look for that label. I was wondering if that would be a good model to follow, that we're certifying individual, like the three people on this stage would be certified organic by our association or whatever label we choose to put on it. But I thought it would be a good model to follow, to certify people who are certifiable. <laughs> yeah, so the, I think the question is whether to start a new label. That's what I would And uh, I just say it was a big, a big discussion when the Real Organic Project got started, whether to be standalone or add on to USDA. I don't trust the USDA. None of us trust the USDA. That's why we're doing this in the first place. We understand that. And uh, the final decision was to be add on. And uh, I think there was a, a lot of, uh, nobody, nobody was strong about that, but um, the truth is there is a tremendous amount of investment in the word organic, and we would absolutely have to drop the word organic. There was a lot of investment in organizations like Vermont Organic Farmers, which are now certifiers for the USDA, very honorable certifiers. So there's a lot of real organic being certified. It's just that there's also foganic, there's also walganic. And, uh, you know, how do we separate that? We decided to go with an add-on. It was, it was not uh, a simple decision, and I think it, it was right because the effort to start a new label, it, I, I can tell you, to, to start a simple add-on label, which is only going to have six standards, is enormous. And I, for one, am exhausted. So to start a standalone label is a, is a big project, and, and this is a big enough project for now with a bunch of, you know, volunteer labor. Um, and we'll see how it works. One last thing, and then we'll watch a movie, is, you know, what, what we have now that we didn't have before, the world is changing, so it's a much easier to talk to each other virtually than it used to be. The last letter I sent out about this was open and read by 20,000 people. And uh, I don't know those people. And n at least 19,000 of those were, the letter was forwarded from other people to them. And, you know, so we do have the opportunity to educate ourselves. And people do have conversations. And it isn't just the mass market that is owned by Driscoll's. And they do own the mass market. And, but we, we're all here talking, 
and thousands and thousands of people are talking. So I'm not without hope that we will be able to uh, educate ourselves, and I include myself in that, and come up with a deeper understanding of biological agriculture. So I'm, for one, you know, we're going to retain our certification. I'm certainly going to pay attention to these things as they develop, but I'll focus most of my effort on working to sort of stop the complete corporate takeover. You, you gotta, somebody has to fight on that field, and not that Dave certainly has, has and will continue to spend his time banging his head against the walls of Washington, D.C., like I do. Um, but that's an important place to, to start. Um, and again, you got to look at what do these labels mean? What do they do to the marketplace? Honestly, like I said before, I don't really need the label. I've got it. I'm invested in it. And I, I don't think I have the energy to write a new one. Michael, We're fighting many fights. Let's, let's just keep doing it. Organic is our word. Screw them. <laughs> Thank you guys for coming.